All right, the first lesson you got to learn is when politicians and presidential candidates do that, they don't mean it. What they mean is this. They want to keep hearing from you. I'm very proud to be here with all of you. Uh, you're having fun here, which is a good thing. We have important work to do, all of us, important work to do to change this country and to bring about the bold change that can help move America forward. Let me start by saying uh, a personal thank you to so many of you who have been so wonderful in support of uh, my wife, Elizabeth. I just spoke to her. She sends her love to all of you and says thank you to all of you. I also want to acknowledge the families of nine firefighters who lost their lives in Charleston, South Carolina uh, yesterday. A uh, great loss for uh, my home state, the state in which I was born, uh, South Carolina. Uh, grew up in North Carolina, but was born in South Carolina. And we want to acknowledge the incredible sacrifice that those firefighters have made and that their families have made. I want to, I want to start talking about the war in Iraq because we need to bring this war to an end. And, and I want to be clear to many of you who have heard me speak before. I voted for this war, and I was wrong to vote for this war. And I take responsibility for that. I will have to live with that. But now we're at an important moment in the history of the country and in the history of this war. Because my view is that the Congress had a mandate as a result of the election last November. The American people made it very, very clear what they wanted. They wanted to see a change, they wanted to see a different course in Iraq, and they wanted to see America leaving Iraq. And what the Congress met its responsibility when it submitted the first bill to the President, with it funding the troops with a timetable for withdrawal, then the President of the United States vetoed that bill. It was sent back to the Congress. It was time for the Congress to stand firm, to stand strong, and to have courage. Unfortunately, that did not happen, but we need strength and conviction in the Congress. This President has no intention of ending this war. He doesn't listen to anybody else. He thinks he's incapable of making mistakes, and man, he's made some mistakes. And we have to force him to end this war. The Congress has to force this president to end this war. The Congress is speaking on behalf of the American people. It's the president who's trying to stop the will of the American people. And, I, and I, you know, to be very simple about this, whether it's the war in Iraq, whether it's universal health care, whether it's getting off our addiction to oil, whether it's dealing with the issue of climate change, whether it's dealing with an issue that's enormously important to me, which is the inequality that still exists in this country and 37 million people who wake up every single day in poverty. For me, it's very simple, and this is it. No more pontificating. No more vacillating, no more triangulating, no more broken promises, no more pats on the head, no more we'll get around to it next time, no more taking half a loaf, no more tomorrow. For the men and women who are leaving this country to go serve in Iraq, there is no tomorrow. For the women, women around this country who have, like my wife, been diagnosed with cancer or breast cancer, you can't talk about putting universal health care in tomorrow. We need to do these things now. We, we, our party, we need to be bold. We need to have backbone. We need to have courage. It is time for us to lead again. It is time for us to show the leadership that America and the world needs from us. And there is so much work to do. And it's not just ending the war in Iraq. You know, the first thing we have to do is we have to establish America as a force for good in the world again. You look at what's happened, the war in Iraq, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, torture, the illegal spying on the American people. And by the way, on the first day that I'm sworn in as President of the United States, I will close Guantanamo. But it's, it's about first stopping the damage. 
stopping the damage that this president and this administration have done, and we need to do those things. We need to make it absolutely clear that we're leaving Iraq. We need to close Guantanamo. We need the President of the United States to say to the world, America will neither condone or engage in torture, that we will comply with Geneva. We need the President of the United States to say to the American people, we will not, the President is not above the law. The President will not spy on you illegally. The President himself will follow the law. But it's about more than stopping the damage. It's also about America being, meeting its responsibility to humanity. We have an enormous responsibility. We're the most powerful, richest nation on the planet. And we know what the world thinks about us now, right? They think we're a bully. They think we're selfish. They think the only thing that America cares about is the expansion of American power. This has to change. The President of the United States has to travel the world and speak to the people of the world about the things that we really are, that we are a country that embraces equality. We are a country that embraces diversity, every kind of diversity, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, faith diversity, because the world believes that we're at war with the Muslim world. And that has got to change. It has got to end. But we have to do more than that. Amer the world needs to see America taking action that demonstrates that we understand our responsibility to humanity. We're going to meet our responsibility to humanity. There are so many things for us to do. What about this genocide that's going on in Western Sudan in Darfur? And think about this. Let's do something just for a minute. Stay with me on this. If instead of seeing this through our eyes, you see it through the eyes of the rest of the world, this is what you see. The most powerful nation on the planet has declared that a genocide is occurring. Th hundreds of thousands killed, women raped, villages destroyed, and then stepped back and watched it continue. What would you think of us? Exactly the same thing is true about the spread of HIV AIDS. Today, today, there will be thousands of children born in Africa with AIDS. Why? Because their mother can't spend $4 for a dose of medicine. $4. An entire new generation of children with AIDS. And the richest nation on the planet stands quietly by and watches this continue. What would you think of us? We're better than this. The United States of America is better than this. And the world needs to see who we are. I, I'm, I'm with you, brothers and sisters. You're right. You're right. That's exactly what we have to do. But suppose, here's an idea. Suppose instead of America spending $500 billion and counting in Iraq, suppose America led an international effort to make primary school available to all of the 100 million children in the world who have no education whatsoever. In Africa, in Asia, in the Muslim world, in Latin America. Think about the transformation that that kind of change can bring about. Suppose America led the way to stopping the spread of disease in the third world, something that I care a lot about because I've done work, humanitarian work in, uh, in Africa and in Asia over the last few years. But America could make such a difference. Clean drinking water and sanitation would change everything. And America needs to lead again on these issues. Suppose, suppose America led the effort toward economic development, especially in the third world, with micro lending, micro finance. All of a sudden, you've got young people and families who believe they have a chance again. Hope is back again. The one thing that has been absolutely clear over the last six plus years now is that America cannot be a leader through raw power. America has to demonstrate that we are worthy of leadership that it is the right thing for the rest of the world to follow American leadership. That will never happen unless the world sees America as the light again, that we're the source of hope, that everyone wants to be like the United States of America. And here's another place where we can demonstrate leadership and think about the consequences. We have a crisis on this planet, and that crisis is global warming. And America has got to show 
that we can be an example for good, not an example for bad. We're 4% of the world's population, emitting 25% of the world's greenhouse gases. We're a terrible example. We're the worst polluter on the planet. China's catching us, but they're still behind. So the question is, what do we do, and what are the consequences of American leadership on this issue? Here's what I think we ought to do. I think we ought to cap greenhouse emissions in the United States of America. I think we ought to ratchet that cap down every single year. I think we ought to reduce greenhouse emissions by at least 80 percent by the year 2050. I think below the cap. I think below the cap we ought to auction off the right to emit any greenhouse gases. That and the proceeds of that auction. Ought to, be ought to be used to transform the way we produce energy in this country. A national investment in wind, solar, cellulose-based biofuels. America, America needs to put at least a billion dollars in the development and implementation of uh, carbon capture, carbon sequestration technology. And by the way, until and if we do, there should not be another coal-fired power plant built in the United States of America. America, America should lead the way by building the most innovative, most fuel-efficient vehicles on the planet with union workers, not having them built somewhere else. And, and finally, brothers and sisters, it is time for the President of the United States to ask Americans to be patriotic about something other than war. It is time to ask Americans if you love your country, you have to conserve in your home, in your workplace. You have to drive more fuel-efficient vehicles. But think about the consequences of American leadership on this issue. First of all, we transform America, get off our addiction to oil. We're using 22 million barrels of oil a day. In the process, we'll create at least a minimum of a million new jobs, green-collar jobs, in the United States of America. Put those jobs in places where we need them. But in addition to changing America, America's economy, we can also transform the Middle East. I mean, we know what's happening in the Middle East now. We have bad leaders. We have bad governments. They don't educate their kids. They have no interest in political, political reform. They have no interest in economic development. Why? They're on a drug, and they're mainlining it, and that drug is oil. The United States of America has to change this. Think about this. America gets off its addiction to oil. The Europeans follow. The Japanese follow. All of a sudden, the price of oil plummets. What happens in the Middle East? They have no choice. They have to educate their kids. They have to economically develop. And in the process, we are undermining the forces of hopelessness and despair that feed terrorism, that threaten the security of the world. Think about the consequences of American leadership. Here's another one. Besides what we do in America, besides what we do in the Middle East, if America leads and gets off its addiction to oil, and all of a sudden we're, we're fueling our vehicles with cellulose-based biofuels, the Europeans follow, the Japanese follow, we have the land mass, we have the farms to support that effort. The Europeans do not. So think about this. What are they going to do? I can tell you what they're going to do. They're going to look for cheap land and cheap labor. Where are they going? Africa. They're going to Africa. And think about the consequences. America gets off its addiction to oil, and millions of children in Africa are lifted out of poverty as a result. There are so many positive consequences from American leadership. We cannot stand silently by and watch the West rest of the world struggle, watch humanity struggle. America has to be seen as a force for good again. And here, in our own country, where we have 37 million people who wake up every single day worried about feeding and clothing their children. This is not okay. And it says something about the character of America, what we're willing to do about it. You know, I grew up watching Bobby Kennedy go through Appalachia and show this country the other America that most of Americans didn't either know about or didn't want to think about. Those pictures that came out of the Ninth Ward of New Orleans after the hurricane hit, is there anyone in this room that thinks we're the only ones who saw those pictures? The entire world saw them. I saw a headline overseas after the hurricane hit, had pictures of victims of the, in the Ninth Ward. Huge headline. 
the shaming of America. The world is watching. They want to know whether America, the richest nation on the planet, thinks it's okay what that we saw in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, thinks it's okay that we have millions of children who are literally worried about survival. Whether they think it's okay, I, I've been all over the, you all probably know this, but I run a poverty center at the university, we have been running, poverty center at the University of North Carolina, which I'm very proud of, but, and by the way, I didn't come here to sell my book, <laughs> but I have a new book out about ending poverty in America. Uh, I'd love for you to look at it. some great ideas in it, not just mine, uh, ideas from other people. But I was in Kansas City in this work a couple of years ago, and I met this woman. She was uh, in her 30s. She had four children. She worked for $9.50 an hour, had no health care benefits, no pension, nothing else. And she told me that she did not have the money to pay her heating bill. And she said, so what I do every night is I wrap my kids in their warmest clothes, put them in the same bed, put as many covers as I can possibly find on top of them, and have them hug each other to stay warm. And then I get them out of bed in the morning, and I feed them, and I send them off to school. And the last thing I say to them is, for goodness sakes, do not tell anybody at school what's happening here, because they'll come and take you, take you away from me. And then she looked at me and she said, how can it be that in the United States of America, people who work full time like I do live like this? This is not okay. And there is something we can do about it. They, we can lead on this effort. And all those people who say, you know, all the naysayers who say, you know, we fought a war on poverty. It didn't work. There's a lot we can do. How about if we have a decent living wage for people who are working for a living? How about, how about if we expand and strengthen the right of workers to organize a union in the workplace? How about, and by the way, by the way, I've been, the other thing, one other, one other thing I've been doing over the last few years, I've been all over this country helping organize workers into unions, helping. We've organized thousands of workers into unions, but I have seen the abuses. I have seen them up close. I have a really simple view about what the law in America ought to be, and you all are going to leave here and go over and rally on it. You know, if you can join the Republican Party by signing your name to a card, any worker in America ought to be able to join a union by doing exactly the same thing. That's democracy. That's what we believe in. And by the way, while we're at it, if we really want to strengthen the union movement, and strengthening the union movement is the key to lifting families out of poverty. The greatest anti-poverty movement in American history is the organized labor movement. The organized labor movement built the middle class in the United States of America. And we need a president of the United States who will go on the White House lawn and explain to the American people how important organized labor is, how important the union movement is, to strengthen and growing the middle class, lifting millions of families out of poverty reminding them that all these manufacturing jobs that we've lost that we're also worried about, they weren't good jobs before the union. It was the union that made them good jobs. It was the union that created good pay. It was the union that provided health care. It was the union that provided uh, retirement security. We have many other things to do. Our national housing policy is a disaster. A complete, we cluster poor people together. We feed the cycle of poverty. Those pictures you saw coming out of the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Suppose we actually face up to the economic and racial segregation that still exists in this country. Instead of pretending that it's not true, suppose we have thousands and thousands of people across this country waiting five, six, seven years to get a Section 8 housing voucher. Suppose we have a million new Section 8 housing vouchers, and instead of using them to cluster poor people together, we use them to break down some of these economic and racial barriers so that people can move. It should not be, not in the United States of America, that the only people that can go to another neighborhood or another place are people of wealth. That's not America. That's not who we are. Suppose we create a million new stepping stone jobs so that kids who are having trouble getting work, chronically out of work, we can put them to work in our parks, in our libraries, in public work, so that they can have a job, so that they can work, develop a work ethic. There's so much good to be done out there. Suppose 
Instead of taking billions of dollars out of the budget for kids to be able to go to college, which is what this president has done, suppose instead that we had something called College for Everyone. Here's the idea, very simple. If a kid graduates from high school and they're qualified to go to college and they commit to work at least 10 hours a week when they're there, we cover their tuition and books. Very simple. We've actually, by the way, uh, Elizabeth and I started a College for Everyone program for the first year of college in eastern North Carolina in a low-income area. It's been incredibly successful. The reason? Because we don't give it to them. They have to work for it. But the result is they don't graduate from college with all this crushing burden of debt that so many of our kids are faced with every single day. It's all about knocking down barriers. It's all about creating opportunity. And we have got to do something about a completely dysfunctional health care system in the United States of America. Uh, we desperately, desperately need truly universal health care for every man, woman, and child in this country. Now, you all get to decide what your test is. My test is very simple. Uh, there's at least one other candidate who's come out with a health care plan. I applaud him for that. But I, I want to say, for me, the threshold test is, is it universal? Does it really, really cover every single man, woman, and child in this country? Because somebody will have to explain to me what child deserves to go without health care? What mother deserves to go without health care? What victim of the next bad diagnosis is not going to get the health care that they're entitled to? You know, we've been blessed. Elizabeth and I have been blessed, and I know some of you and many of you have been blessed. But the truth of the matter is we have 45 million at least people in this country who if they wake up in the middle of the night with a sick child, they're going to go to the emergency room and beg for health care. The United States of America is better than this. We need universal health care. We need to cover every man, woman, and child. I think we ought to fill in the cracks in our health care system. We should ban the existing of pre existence of pre-existing conditions. No more in America. We ought to treat mental health exactly the same way we treat physical health, mental health parity. We ought to cover preventive care, long-term care, chronic care, vision care, dental care. And people ought to be able to take their health care with them from place to place to place, from job to job to job. Now, I want to say one other thing to you about this. I'm confident during the course of this campaign that some candidate, or maybe more than one, are going to come before you and say, listen, we're going to have universal health care. We're going to transform the way we use energy. We're going to lift millions of people out of poverty. We're going to make sure kids get to go to college. We're going to change our national housing policy. And in the process, we're also going to eliminate the federal deficit. Listen, is it finally time for us to have a President of the United States that will be honest with the American people? It costs money to have universal health care. I'll be the first to say it. My plan costs 90 to $120 billion a year. It's not cheap. But I pay for it by getting rid of Bush's tax cuts for people who make over $200,000 a year. My final message to you is you have no idea how much I appreciate your activism, your engagement, your involvement. The great movements in American history, they didn't begin in the Oval Office. They began all across this country. I grew up with the Civil Rights Movement. I know where it started. It didn't start in the Oval Office. And it didn't start in Washington, D.C. It started in communities. It started on college and university campuses where young people had courage and backbone and stood up to do something. They changed this country. They changed this country. The same thing happened in ending the war in Vietnam. The same thing happened in ending this brutal apartheid regime in South Africa. You can feel it. The same thing is happening right now across America to end this war in Iraq. We have such opportunities to do great things. But we cannot do it without you. Your country needs you. It needs you to take responsibility. It needs you to take action. 
You know, Elizabeth and I were confronted with a choice a few months ago, which I'm sure all of you know about. And we made the decision, uh, Elizabeth was a powerful voice in that, but we made the decision that this is our life. This is our cause. Whatever happens politically, whatever happens in this election, this is what I intend to do for the rest of my life. I will speak for the poor. I will speak for the uninsured. I will speak for the disenfranchised. This is my life, and I'm going to do it as long as I'm alive and breathing. But I, but I want to say to all of you, I want to say to all of you, we've made a choice about what we're committed to do. My question to you is this. What are you willing to do? How much are you willing to do? How much do you love this country? To paraphrase Gandhi, you've got to be the change you believe in. You can't stay home and wait for somebody else to do this for you. You can't hope that somebody else is going to bring about these broad, big, sweeping changes that America and the world need so desperately. Your country needs you. Everybody in America needs you. We need you engaged. We need you involved. We need to hear your voice. Because if you want to live in a moral and just America, where everybody, no matter who you are, who your family is, what the color of your skin, where you live, everybody has a real chance. And if you actually want to see America once again leading in a moral and just world, we have to do this together, every single one of us. And brothers and sisters, we're going to do it together. We're going to march out of this room together right now and go march for employee free choice. Thank you all very much. It's a great privilege for me to be with you. God bless you all. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you.